Chapter 9 The Mad Night of the Hunted Hunters It was a somewhat miserable wolf who appeared beneath the little oak trees, for he was soaking wet, dirty and limping. It had rained the whole night through, and showers were still falling. Renard had taken shelter in the hollow trunk of the great beech. He came up to Eastgrim. "'I'm so glad to see you again,' he said. "'Well done, Uncle. You settled them all right.' "'All's well,' said the wolf, sinking down at the foot of the tree. "'At least I managed to get out without having to burst.' He described how frightened the peasants had been, for they had expected to see a little fox and found no less than the wolf Eastgrim in person. They shouted and ran away into the hayloft, climbing up the ladder four steps at a time. It was a miracle that everything had not gone up in flames. Eastgrim would have escaped without harm. "'If a wretched big lout, whose hair was almost as red as yours, Renard, had not set a horrible mastiff on his heels, with a tooth protruding from his muzzle. "'Surly,' said the fox. "'That was what the man called him. It was an enormous, sharp, penetrating tooth. I noticed it first. But the brute didn't have the last word. He'll respect me in future.' "'Well done, uncle,' repeated Renard. I expect you bit him? I bit him, rolled him over, trampled on him and clawed him. In return for the inch of skin he removed from me, I took a long strip from him. Next time, in true East Grim style, I'll dig out the pit of his stomach and measure the length of his guts. If only you'd done so, Uncle. It was this lout, this wicked Rufus, a Sorry, Renard, if I ever called you that. Don't worry, Uncle, don't worry, said Renard. It was only Outram. May the devil roast him in hell. He will roast there, I'll see to that. You were saying? He threw his fork at me from a distance, and he didn't aim badly. Did he hurt you, Uncle, by chance? Hardly at all, and only with the handle. I want to take care of you said Renard, with herb plasters on these wounds and plantain which you must swallow. When necessary, I'm an apothecary, you know. I know, Renard. I love you, Renard. If ever... Good, uncle, good. Let me go on. I want to admit my mistakes. Clumsy fool that I was. Oh, yes, I was, Renard. Before I can recover my peace of mind, Renard, you must grant me absolution. Absolvo, said Renard, lowering his eyelids over eyes glittering with joy. He tended Eastgrim, pressing heavily on the bruises and pulling at the edge of the wounds. Alas, there was nothing that looked serious, and a wolf of such vitality would recover in a few days. But Eastgrim must have dashed along at the first hint of pain. He was panting, his tongue was dry and hung out a foot. His heart was pounding and made his ribs shake. Rest. Rest, said Renard gently. Poor dear uncle, you're exhausted. I, said the wolf. A snail, whom the rain had made quite lively, was gliding along the pathway at their feet. Renard saw him and went on gaily. So exhausted, uncle, that you can't win a race against Slowcoach. What? said the wolf, and he jumped to his feet at once, wagging his tail and looking furious. "'It's most unwise,' said Renard, "'to challenge a snail, but you asked for it, uncle.' "'Where, Slowcoach?' cried Eastgrim. "'Where is he, this Slowcoach who wants to win a race against the wolf?' "'I don't want to do anything, sir,' said Slowcoach. "'But now I want to!' and his tail swished against the brambles, lashing the low branches and scattering the leaves and raindrops. "'How far, uncle?' said Renard. "'As far as that silver birch over there!' "'Take your places, then,' said Renard. "'You, uncle, in the middle of the path. "'There'll always be room enough for little slow coach. "'Wait, I am going to the birch tree, where you can see me clearly.' I'll give the signal from there. He rushed off, 
soon reached the birch tree, peered round him and saw at once what he was looking for. All the snails of the woods had put out their horns and were slabbering with pleasure in the rain. Renard gave the signal quickly and Eastgrim set off like lightning. You've lost, uncle, said Renard. Slowcoach was there, in the pathway, at the end of a long trail of silver, his horns on high, cocking a snook at the wolf. Revenge! howled Eastgrim. As far as the great beach, said Renard. About turn, wait a moment for the signal. Too bad, you've lost again, uncle. Look at slow coach, he's won a second time. Revenge! Revenge! roared the wolf. Renard made him run like this until his coat steamed and he lost his breath. But his rage and pride sent him from beach to birch, from birch to beach, from slow coach to slow coach, his sides heaving, his tongue hanging down to his feet, and his eyes no longer yellow, but as red as the winter sun. He dashed about until twilight. Any other creature would have shed his skin, but Eastgrim shed only his stomach. When night fell, he was as thin as he had been the day before when he entered the larder. Renard thought of taking him back there, for Eastgrim's unparalleled stupidity and the pleasure it gave him intoxicated him, like Foucher the Carter when he drank Constance wine. At this moment, a distant barking was heard through the expanse of calm. Neither of them could mistake it. It was the barking of a dog on the scent. The barking began again and quickly came closer. Renard knew the bark well. He realised that Surly, after starting to seek on his own account, had picked up the scent and had set out after the wolf. Unless... Be careful, Renard. He began to tremble and thought of escaping to Malpass, but it was already too late. Surly was barking under the trees and had cut off the line of retreat that would have taken him back to his earth. Wolf and Fox rushed off together in silence and plunged through the undergrowth. The rain was still falling, so regularly and softly that it could no longer be heard, but very soon their dripping coats were as heavy as soaking wet sponges. Surly's coat was clipped short. They could imagine him behind them, silent now, coming forward, following a strong scent, determined and dangerous. Renard could smell Eastgrim beside him, the acrid warm smell of a creature who was being run to earth, an unbearable, clinging, hateful smell. He felt it gradually impregnating him, condemning them both to the same menace, and it would be worse for him, for he was smaller, and Surly hated him as much as he hated the wolf. As they ran, he whispered to Eastgrim, This is a bad business for us, uncle, but perhaps the moment has come when you will at last encounter Renard's true devotion, love and fidelity. I have an idea. Adopted in advance, said the wolf. I'm listening. But you'll have to go on running still. Can you do it? All night if necessary, said the wolf. Then Renard explained his idea. Eastgrim wagged his tail and seemed to leap as he ran. He was all the same a proud wolf, a male at the height of his power, capable of running forty leagues. Renard turned a very sharp corner, returned to his former course, and then turned again with such daring that this time they could see Surly pass by between the saplings in the copse. The wolf had followed the fox blindly, nose to tail. Careful, warned Renard. Now's the moment. Go straight to him. Don't forget. Stay glued to him, whatever he does and whatever happens. I understand, whispered the big grey wolf. Renard slowed down and sat on his haunches, as motionless as a tree stump. Eastgrim trotted on his way, taking long, silent steps, matching them exactly with Surly's, the dog following his nose and the wolf now following his eyes. Renard followed the chase, listening and pricking his long, fine ears. Whenever he thought that Eastgrim was faltering a little, he uttered a short bark, which brought the wolf back to the course. The mastiff gradually lost both the scent and his head simultaneously. Still silent, steadying himself on the ground and against the branches, holding his head low now and seeking about in confused circles, he ran round and round interminably. If the wolf had been cleverer, he could have stretched out on the ground and recovered his breath quietly. But he was so afraid of losing sight of Surly that he remained glued to him, as though attached by the strap linking the two collars of a pair of dogs. 
and their shadows continued to pass through the forest, hunter hunting and hunter hunted. The wolf panting, the mastiff whimpering and groaning in spite of himself, starting off again, turning round, breaking through, going back, faltering, stumbling, jumping over the ditches and the pathways, one in front of the other, one behind the other, right through the night which was already coming to an end. Who knows, they might have gone on until the last judgement.